we will start now. Uh, so now for something completely different, because I wanted to show you, tell you something about uh, reinforcement learning. I'll try to give you some intuition about it and uh, introduce a new framework, PyTorch, which I'm very excited about. I hope that you will try it at home when you have some time. So let's start. Uh, first of all, we will tell something about reinforcement learning. Uh, how it's uh, done in the simplest form, how it's done now, where it all started, and then something about PyTorch. So the best uh, way to start about uh, start talking about reinforcement learning to, is to tell about a problem, because uh, according to Satan and Barton in their book, and the definition of reinforcement learning is a method is every method that tackles a specified problem with uh, three basic her her characteristics. First, uh, problem have trial and error learning process. So it learns from its own uh, actions, uh, give it gets some uh, evaluation, some reward, and then it try to uh, learn based on it. Uh, reward is delayed. As in many games, for example, uh, after some level we get the points and lack of specified instruction. Engine, uh, agent have to find for himself the best way to, uh, to tackle the problem. So there's a really wide array of methods to do that, uh, starting from uh, dynamic programming, Monte Carlo methods, uh, temporal difference lear learning, and uh, Q-learning, which is now the most popular, I think, since it involves deep learning and some convolutional neural networks, and but that in a minute. <coughs> Besides uh, uh, some the specification for each problem, uh, every problem is based on some kind of a loop, uh, which gives us um, feedback. And agent is performing actions and gets uh, feedback in, in the form of reward for this action, and it knows now the state. The state is changed, and based on the state and reward, agent is trying to modify this action. Action is generated by policy. Policy affects everything uh, with agent's behavior, and we are trying to optimize it to generate the best possible output. Mm. And uh, at the beginning, Q-learning was just uh, storing some values in, in table, basically. Uh, and when we we're talking about Q-learning, this Q is value of, uh, of action that we want to take. Because reward is uh, short term. It's a reward for each action. And uh, value of action tells us what kind of reward at the end, total reward, we can expect from this action. So we want to optimize the best long-term solution for this. And it was done uh, by this, it's not, it's simple update rule, I've seen worse, uh, which we basically uh, take the value of action and update it based on lear uh, learning rate. I assume that most of you know what that is, but uh, learning rate uh, affects um, how fast algorithm will learn, how much it will uh, learn based on the last action. And we take into account uh, reward after action that they take and uh, maximal um, profit that we can gain from possible action that can be taken from that place. So an actor can choose from a variety of actions, each one have value and which is the best one. Uh, and that is controlled by um, variable gamma. This one tells us uh, how much uh, we want to look into the future. If gamma is small, we want to, as fast as possible, the best reward. If it's uh, big, we, we, we look into the future. So it's not very complicated, uh, but uh, in, it also have in its, um, problems, maybe the practical little problems we need to take into account, like exploration versus exploitation problem. 
because greedy approach is not the best. Everyone who programs something knows that it's fast solution, but not the best, maybe not optimal. Uh, and here, agent will just choose action with the highest value uh, without thinking, and probably will get stuck in some non-optimal solution, just repeating actions over and over. So we need to uh, explore, find some better paths, better routes. Uh, some we haven't seen and maybe are better. Uh, that's why, uh, in the simplest form, uh, we can introduce Epsilon greedy approach, which we take sometimes. Uh, epsilon defines how often. We just don't take the best solution. We take the less, maybe less possible, um, with some lower value, and we just see what's happened. Maybe it's better, maybe not, but it's good to know what's behind the corner. And uh, also uh, practical maybe advice, it's good to change it over time. So at first agent will explore more and then uh, choose the paths that he knows is, are the best. And here's a little example. I will, <laughs> I will explain it to you what is that. Uh, it's a simple room exploration problem. It's a toy problem. Uh, in real life problems, it will be much bigger. Uh, actor will have probably uh, more actions to choose from. Here, in, it has to go from uh, square marked as red to this green one. Just from each room, it can go right, uh, left, up, down. And just have to find path, very simple. So how it's done with Q-learning? Uh, Every action have assigned some value. At the beginning, I've just zero, because why not? It's a good value. Uh, so in the first run, it just moves randomly until it gets to, to this goal and gets reward for that. And the value of that action, it's increased very much. <laughs> in other run, these kind of iterations are repeated over and over again until the agent reaches almost every state, reaches every state many times, so that's, that would be the best, and learns a Q function behind it. So in every iteration, we find path and checks for the best, uh, best solution, best value, and, and update uh, states which lead us to it, value of the states which lead us to it. So I don't know if you can see these numbers are really small, but it gets it increased. Every time we find a new state that we know will lead us to goal, we increase its value. And that is the simple, simplest basic uh, approach to Q-learning. Uh, and this value will just start in, in some tables. And this is a small pr problem. With, which means that table won't be big. But for real life problems, just a second. Real life problem, uh, for example, robot that have to explore some floor. Uh, we assume that the area is 500 meters, square kilometers, the grid is small, and for just eight actions. Sometimes this robot have some practical approach, not just moving around, so they will have much more actions. Uh, much more area to cover, and table size with just this example, example on our, our data, it's uh, 1.5 million states. So that that big array, it's, it's not efficient, it doesn't scale. We, no one likes this kind of problems, uh, especially if you have some embedded system. It's, no, not, not fun. So, uh, neural networks. Great hit nowadays, and it's a great form of approximation of functions. So why not use it to approximate this key function that we want to find? There's no reason why not to try that. And it's even better because it can generalize, generalize to states that uh, actor was never in, which is not possible with the standard approach with tables. A uh, model are easy to alter. You cannot alter the table. It has to stay the same. Here you can change layers, add more layers, different layers, 
many operations of la on layers. And uh, actual complexity of, uh, of problem doesn't define how big we have to make this model. Problem might be very complicated and we put there two layers and we'll be happy about it. And of course, everyone wants to go deeper. So also deep Q learning, why not? Uh, models even bigger, more complicated with convolutional networks and uh, because we can, we can learn some, play some games from pixel levels. Like uh, it will handle high dimensional input like, uh, like these Atari games. It's very popular in reinforcement learning. Uh, just uh, learning how to play Mario with uh, input from the screen. No need to encode anything, just snapshot of Mario running around. It will, it will manage it, it will learn. Uh, but also have some tricks, uh, also need some tricks to uh, work this, to, to work with this. Like replay experience, because it's not easy to train uh, such, uh, such a network. And uh, some intuition between be behind replay experience is that when we learn some network, we don't want to put highly correlated data in it at once. Uh, like with NIST problem. You may be heard about this data set with numbers, zeros, ones, twos. And when you learn network to recognize this number, you won't put just only zeros first, and then only ones, and then only twos. It will learn to recognize greatly zeros, then when you show it once, it will just totally drop in performance. So here also you want to put data that's not, this, uh, that's not very correlated. So you put observations, transitions, so the state, action that was taken, reward you get, and state is it was after behind it, into the memory. And you sample just put from the beginning of the game, in the middle, in the end. That way you have very nice data for training uh, neural networks. And uh, here are some letters, more letters. Uh, how to update this thing? Uh, well, we assume that it obeys Bellman equation. Every single uh, key function must obey it, so it's reasonable assumption. And we base on temporal difference error, because Q-learning uh, came from merge of temporal difference learning methods and uh, dynamic programming. So we use uh, this, uh, this equation, which gives us temporal difference error, which is uh, actual key value that we wanted to uh, predict and the one that we, that we did predict. And this is example uh, uh, of minimization f function, it is, it's Huber loss. Um, you can use anything other, I just like that one, so no pressure. Uh, and here's some nice visualization, how, how would this rep replay experience work? Uh, this is actually the input that uh, people fit uh, networks, just no encoding, nothing. Just put it there and it will manage everything. Uh, we store it into the memory and then randomly choose some to put into the network. and. That way we have much smoother training, um, train, yeah, much smoother training. Um, and now something even better, I think. PyTorch is a great new uh, framework. Uh, and at the beginning there was Torch, which I personally like very much. I'm very fond of it. It's, uh, some of you might have heard of it. Uh, it it was used by Facebook research, uh, OpenNI, and it's based on Lua, which means that's, uh, that's why some people don't like it, and it lacks uh, some of the development tools that Python has. But it's extremely fast, uh, got uh, underlying uh, implementation in CUDA and C, if you, if you, very, if you like uh, coding in, CUDA, in C CUDA, then you can write your own code there and, and push there, they will be happy. Uh, very active community, state-of-the-art models just work, waiting there for you to work on them. There's, I've seen even, uh, even filters on Facebook when, with uh, 
art style transfer when you can change your face into Monet painting. It's it's very very funny, very very fun to play with. Uh, yes, but not very people like it because it's not practical to use in production. For example, it's very good for research, but not production. And uh, let's be honest, machine learning world loves Python and loves Python big time. So some very great people from Facebook, Twitter, NVIDIA, Oxford, Stanford, uh, great minds, came together and put the best features of Python and Torch and put it together to create PyTorch, which I, <laughs> which I would like you to try sometimes, maybe. It's extremely easy to learn, and if you know some Python, uh, then you will have no problem with this. It's just, data storage is just as simple as NumPy arrays. Um, there's tensors are very similar, just calls another, just the name is another. And you, um, you yeah, uh, I don't know, maybe you played with CUDA sometimes. And to learn something of CUDA, it, it hurts. If you seen cafe code, it's 2,000 lines for one model. Very painful to look at. And here you just create tensors and write dot CUDA and it's copied on CUDA and you can work on it on GPU. Wonderful. And it gives you all the good stuff that was in Torch, which, mean, which means uh, all layers that people think of and uh, write papers about. It's, it's all there because they put it on. Basically, two days later, this everything is implemented and uh, available. Uh, CUDA support, optimization algorithms, ev everything you like, and Torch Vision. Um, yeah, <laughs> everything. And AutoGuard, that's that's very nice feature. I will take uh, tell you about this in a moment. And to create network, it's. As many layers as you want, it's one layer, it's one line of code. It's so beautiful, <laughs> so simple. Uh, and it's pretty elegant, I think. Um, I, I hope you will look to, into documentation to learn something more about it, because I don't want to bore you with some details about code. And Autograd, if some of you like math or writing your own layers, uh, then writing custom layer was a pain because you had to take paper, uh, pencil, and compute all derivatives uh, by hand. Here you don't have to you just put it in, into variable uh, wrapper and function wrapper, and it's just write back propagate. Also, with training, you have just simple, very simple uh, loop, just standard thing forward compute loss backward and it's all training it's all working it's so very convenient very nice and uh, demo which i unfortunately have on the other laptop but uh, i i think that you may like it because uh, if someone in interesting uh, please visit crowd ai uh, it's a challenge one of the challenge there uh, to learn a uh, that, that pretty half of skeleton with muscles to walk. It's uh, very, very interesting, I think. And uh, reward is a ticket to some con convention in Switzerland, I think, with with all expenses paid. So, so fun. Why not? And uh, I used to, for training um, very simple network with four layers, fully connected and. After two hours, I think it learned to wo to move 20 centimeters. So, so it takes some time if you don't have a very good, uh, a very good hardware. And I think that's it. that's it at the moment. That's that's all I have. Okay, so no questions. Thank you. Thank you.